Well, welcome and thank you all for joining us. We're very excited, we being the Office of Diversity and Inclusion here at Wichita State University celebrating Women's Equality Day. I have a powerhouse panel of strong women making moves both on our campus and in the community. I like to call them movers, shakers, and some of them are actually shockers as well. So welcome and thank you all. My name is Danielle Johnson and I have the privilege and pleasure of serving as the Assistant Director here at the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. But you all came to hear from our amazing panelists. So I'm gonna actually do a quick um, introduction of all of these amazing women. And they're gonna give you a little bit of background of what they do um, currently and how they've been engaged. So I'm actually going to start with Dr. Sharon Cranford from the League of Women Voters. So if you wanna just share a little bit about yourself and I'll go right on down the line. Hello everyone, I am a retired educator after uh, teaching at Wichita State and Heston College. I have retired and become an author. I am a singer, a community activist, and of course I am on the board uh, for the League of Women Voters. Awesome, thank you. And next we have Jondalyn Marshall from Roots the Power. Hello, as you said, I am John Dillon Marshall. I am actually the director at the Seed House, but a program manager for Root the Power, which is a youth-led um, organization, which they engage their peers to register to vote, vote and get engaged in the community. Awesome, thank you. We also have Nikayla Pack, who serves as a field director and volunteer and has done a number of amazing things. We just came off of an event that you planned with Bryce Graham and so, no shortage of accolades there. Yeah, hello, my name is Nikayla. Yes, I am field directing for um, Judge Centineo District, um, Court Judge eight, and the 18th Judicial District for Division 11. And yes, I um, help out a lot of nonprofits. I feel like I am a great supporter and um, help uplift those, um, you know, those grassroots uh, efforts and initiatives. So thank you. And then we have two amazing special guests that serve on our campus at Wichita State University in leadership roles, both Rija Khan and Mackenzie Haas, and they'll both tell you a little bit about themselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Rija Khan, as you heard, and I'm the student body president. Um, a little about me is that, you know, I'm an immigrant and I'm the daughter of immigrants. We came to this country a while back and having this citizenship means a lot to us. I am also a woman of faith and I am Muslim. So I have these unique characteristics which we have not seen in you know, previous presidents but, you know, before me. And so being in this role, it's very unique. And then again, I'm also a woman of color. Being here means I have to do a lot more extra work I'd say. And I think we're gonna go into more detail how that looks while we're on this panel. Otherwise, I do the work of the people here on campus. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm Mackenzie Haas. I'm the student body vice president, and it has been really rewarding to uh, campaign across campus and then work with Rijikon in these positions in order to get things done in, in higher positions across the student body. All right. Again, thank you all for serving on this panel today. And actually, Dr. Cranford, I'm going to have you start off being a representative of the League of Women Voters. Can you just provide a brief history of, you know, why, why do we celebrate Women's Equality Day? What does that mean? And, and what has been done? Oh my goodness, we have a long history and many people are surprised to learn that the suffrage movement was actually born out of the abolitionist movement. The fight for women's rights started in the fight for emancipation for black people before the 1840s. And that's why you keep hearing the names Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth in conjunction with women's suffrage. The speech ain't I a woman? That was not made at a civil rights meeting. That was made at a women's suffrage meeting. And it was delivered uh, with fire. Indeed, the fight for women's rights was a very integrated force in the beginning. And so how did the League of Women Voters get so white, people often ask. And why does the media only talk about Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Alice Paul? Well, I'm so glad you asked. You cannot truly understand the history of the League or our present situation 
or our future without understanding our past. And we do have a little bit of a checkered past. We love the league. The official birth of the women's suffrage movement occurred at the Women's Rights Convention at Seneca Falls, New York, July 1848. Enslavement had been abolished in several Northern states as early as the 1780s, beginning with, the Pensa with Pennsylvania, followed by Vermont and New York. And by 1804, all Northern states had abolished it. So blacks and whites had been working together for almost 50 years when that meeting happened. Anybody see the movie Harriet? And you just kind of wave at me if you did or not or something because uh, we often, um, we were looking at all of these finely dressed black people who obviously were doing very, very well uh, before uh, the Civil War. And so I just want you to know that that was not fiction just put into the movie to make it look good. These were actual people of color who were doing well, well before the Civil War. Indeed, several colleges, HBCUs, were founded during that period. And I give you this kind of background information so that you can see what happens to us later and answer that original question. So before I go any further though, I wanna plug in some dates. In 1866, the American Equal Rights Association was established with Fred, Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony as charter members leaders of that particular group. That's the precursor to our organization. In 1869, when the news came about the 15th Amendment, people started going crazy. It got bad. People were upset. And so the organization broke apart. In 1869, the uh, National Women's Suffrage Association started. That's the same year that they started talking about the 15th Amendment. You know, it was ratified the next year. And then the American Women's Association, uh, Suffrage Association, same year. And uh, so they went along pretty well. But this is where so much painful conversation happened and it is affecting us today. And so that's why I really uh, wanted to um, share those kinds of things with you. I don't know how much time I have, but um, I, I, let me throw in um, so I can move things along. Back to this Congress that said, you know, after all of these groups of colors and cultures been working together all of these years, they announce we're only giving black men the vote. And so that's when you started hearing all of this negative stuff. And you, 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 we're still, every time groups, diverse groups start getting together and really making progress, the, all of the negative stuff starts bubbling up and they're doing that even today. But you know, let me let me stay on on course so I can get through. Congress knew they were not going to give black men the vote. They just wanted to split this league up. They did not black people and white people working together and getting things done and making things happen. So they saw how emancipation happened with a coalition of different people working together, not just any one particular, all uh, of the cultures pulled together. And so they could see that happening with the women's movement. And in order to bust that up, they announced only black men, knowing they, the federal government didn't even have the power to give black men the vote in the South. States rights was, was had that tight. 
So they, you know, they just did that to break us up. And they were very successful. Uh, Susan B. Anthony's remarks were so egregious, even Frederick Douglass had to break away. And he tried to hang with them, but it, it just got ugly. So it was 40 years before we tried to get back together again. And that was the end of 1912. And unfortunately, we didn't do that too well with that uh, gathering either, but we did try. Uh, what they tried to do was put together a massive parade of uh, black and white women and men to show unity and to show how uh, we still did not have the vote and we uh, were still being treated unfairly. And we knew that by coming together, maybe we could get something done here. So we put this uh, parade together and then the rumor started that this was not going to be a unity parade as it was originally uh, stated, that they, that the Southern white women decided they did not want to march with black women. And so they announced that the black women would either have to not be in it or march in the back. So, by this time, Alpha Kappa Alpha was five years old, and our national president was Nellie Quander. So she wrote the organizer of the parade, Alice Paul. And she said, we are interested in the parade. As you well know, this is my second letter writing to you. Maybe you didn't get the first one. But if there is any discrimination in this parade at, of any type based on race, we are not going to be there. So the uh, she, she wouldn't answer, Alice Paul never answered the letter, but the parade went on. Some, well, indeed, a lot of black people went ahead and marched in the back. Some eased in the middle, like Ida B. Wells, you heard about her story. And then, uh, of course, some boycotted altogether. But um, we, we continue to work together because in our hearts, we know that all cultures and all different people, whatever your background might be, we need to figure out how to work together and not let powerful people pull us apart because that's how they conquer. And so um, in the last several years, I'm, I'm running, I'm running, Danielle, I promise. Uh, we have a diversi di uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, department, I would call it. And we are working hard to make people to understand that uh, together, our voices united, uh, we can make the world a better place. So 100 years later, here we stand. Thank you. Thank you for that. I know we had to do a, a quick history, a quick recap, but it's always important to have a basic understanding of what we're celebrating, what we're doing, where we've come from and where we still have to go. Uh, I think it's very important to understand that background. So learn more about women's equality today, where we've been, the suffragist movement. Also learn more about the League of Women Voters. What I can respect is an organization that knows its history, doesn't shy away from it and actively put something in place to fix the problems. Right. So that's that's a sign of a growing organization, an organization willing to make the move. So that being said, let's get into this panel dialogue. Uh, many times we hear that women have to be asked several times before they even consider stepping up to lead or to run. What has you all been? What's your experience been with being asked or even resonating with that statement? Why do we have to be asked a million times? to see ourselves in a space. Well, let me let me as 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 the one on the asking in and never on the jumping in there end. Uh, let me say first of all that I know myself and so I've already decided at an early age that I did not want to be a politician and yes, I was asked many times. But you 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 need to know it's like 
being called to be a pastor or being an apostle or being a Christian that speaks. So you know your role and people see how you speak and how you interact with people and they figure they need to, you need to come on. And so that's why I think people keep asking is because they don't understand that you have made a decision and you are going to be asking others. And when you see something there that uh, speaks to being in that field. So I guess I'll jump in on this question because for me, like while growing up, I've always been that one person who wants to be in the leadership roles. I wanna use my platforms to help others, but I've also seen a lot of other women that I grew up around when they were asked to be in certain spaces, when they were asked, hey, you would be perfect for this leadership role. Why don't you join us? Why don't you do it? They just simply didn't see themselves as such. I believe it is sometimes the society, the environment we grow up in, the culture of the area we're living in, the people around us, what they tell us helps us shape the viewpoint of, you know, of who we are and what we can do and what our abilities are. In my family, I would say I'm very, very fortunate where my dad, my brother, my mother, my grandmother, they always said, if you have a platform, you have a voice, you, you don't just keep it to yourself. You go out there and you help each and every other person who needs it, you share that platform. But unfortunately, that's not the case with everyone. I am proud to say that I'm part of the first Muslim sorority in the state of Kansas, known as Mu Delta Alpha. Thank you. And it is so interesting to see the different dynamics, the different viewpoints of us women bring to the table. Yes, we have created, created a space for ourselves, but how are we using it? We see each individual use it differently from what they have been told, from what they've done in the past. We build each other up, we tell each other, it doesn't matter if you know how to do things, as long as you have a vision of doing the right thing, as long as you know where you wanna go, do it, do what is right. And so I guess, you know, I agree with Dr. Sharon as to it's culture and you just have to work together in order to be where you wanna be and where you wanna take others with you. Nice. Yeah, I, I would say I definitely um, agree with what you're saying. Uh, I'm a Shocker alumni and um, my bachelor's in political science and my master's in public administration. And so I definitely had people come to me and asking, you know, hey, have you thought about this? Are you going to? And I know my role. I am a great supporter. I will get behind you if I see that you are really committed to doing what is right, fair and honest, and fighting for, um, you know, just and um, fair solutions. But I, I do think um, with the environment that you speak of, if there, if I'm feeling that way, you know, perhaps there are other women who are being asked this that just think like, how could I possibly do that? You know? And if we are, um, I think that's why it's important of, of these resources, you know, that say, okay, if you do choose to do so, you have a community of support and space that, um, that will be provided for those resources, those know-hows. Um, so you don't feel like you've got to uh, do it all on your own and figure it all out. Um, because there are, um, organizations that can be tapped into to um, explain this process to you um, because it can be overwhelming and uh, confusing. So I think, um, yeah, definitely the environment of, okay, if I were to do this, how would I do it? And um, I think those, those organizations being amplified to know that they're, they're there if you choose to. So please choose to. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's also another avenue of like why it's so important, like why I do what I do with our young people, right? And with Ruth the Power, we kind of are cultivating young leaders. So instead of just saying this is what you should do, but putting them in an environment where they see all like levels to the process, right? From the voter registration to canvassing to uh, engagement, right? And some of them will connect to certain leadership roles at certain levels. So I feel like what we do at Root the Power and at the Seed House is so important. 
put planting that seed early in them so that if that's something that they do, like you said, it's the environment that you're in, right? So trying to create an environment for leadership to flourish, be cultivated, and finding what they gravitate gravitate to, because there's so many levels of leaderships, especially in civil engagement and community work. So, just like you said, creating environments and spaces to to cultivate and bring that out of them, because every everyone might have that in them, but to actually have someone say, "Hey, okay, you might be nervous about doing this, or you might not know how." But let me, like you said, find your resources. Let me show you or let me surround you with leaders and people who will pour this energy into you and and start you in this process. Yeah, to kind of tie off of that, I think it's a lot of confidence. And I think especially as as younger women coming up into big leadership positions, it's hard to be able to say, like, I can do this. And like, I know I have the ability to lead. And so having mentors, I think is huge. So the work that you're doing, Jondalyn, with Root the Powers, like, it's so important because I don't know, to be able to look down and say, you can do this, it gives, you know, myself and other younger leaders the ability to say, yeah, I can, like, let's do it. And, you know, I know, like, we're having this conversation, but I just want to take a different perspective to this. I feel like sometimes when we do provide women a space for leadership I've I feel I've at least experienced this sometimes we're just thrown into it and we don't know what's happening or how do we go about a situation yes I've been put into situations where I mean I'm still learning I I, I would say I'm really young and this is my first time being in a in a role you know with this high importance mm-hmm. and I run into the issue that Sometimes I'm in a meeting and something comes up and I'm just like, wait, why are we discussing this? This is not relevant to the topic. Yes, it's relevant to me as a human being, but why do we have to discuss that instead of the topic itself? So for me, I don't know who to go to to have those conversations to be like, hey, if you were in this situation, how did you deal with that? How do I deal with that? Because I just, because I am here to do the work, I'm I'm not here to talk about like what I did, uh, you know, for other things. I don't want to go into detail as to how that goes. But I think many women, like, or I believe all of you can relate to that on certain level, where you're just thrown in, and you don't know what to do. So I guess my question for you is like, how do you all deal with that? Because I really need the answer. There is I, I, just answer. Want to, <laughs> I do want to add, though, to that, that it is so important, important to have some type of clearinghouse somewhere. I really appreciate your program, Jondalyn, as well as yours, uh, Danielle. It, it just needs to be more publicized and because people not only need information, they need a clearinghouse space where they can say, yes, I want to do it, but first I have a few questions. Right. You know, rather than us constantly pulling, oh, you look, you could handle this, you know, and you don't know what's inside them, but if they already have that burning desire, Mm -hmm. then they could go to the clearinghouse and get their questions answered. There would be resources to shore them up and that's, and maybe they're ready. So that could just be the space where they could say, hey, where can I start working in this area? And and I don't know where that is in, in Wichita. Or, you know, in if there is one place, but I think there's, you know, spots here and there, and we just need to let be more uh, deliberate about making sure people understand where they can go. Mm-hmm. Yes. I thought I saw some folks about to jump in. Jonathan, you were really nodding that head. No, I mean, I, just, just I, said, I wanted to answer the question about like the leadership role. I mean, I'm gonna be honest, some things you can go to school for. Some things you can, you know, you you think you know, but some situations just happen and you don't have an answer for it. And you just, it's very, very important to have a strong, I'm going to say a sister circle or people around you that when you do have those problems, right, that you can actually speak with and you can talk to. And, and I love people who can keep it real with me. You know, you ha- they can't always be yes people. Yeah, you're doing everything right. You need that person that's going to say, well, okay, I hear I- they actually listen to you. First off, they're actually listening to you. And they're not listening just to answer. They're like, they're digesting it. 
and they actually make you look at both sides of the situation, right? Like to analyze and have a true, true discussion of possible scenarios, um, outcomes, decisions and things and how you can maneuver, how you can tackle it. But you have to find someone that you can actually, you know, talk to about these things and you trust what they have to say, number one, and that they're not just gonna tell you what you wanna hear. So that's just my advice. <laughs> An important advice. And this kind of goes into the next question. You know, we talk about having representation and women in these spaces. Why is it so important to actually visually see someone that maybe represents one of your identities? Is that important? I think it's so important. I recently, coming back um, from Thailand, I was going through some boxes of stuff and I found something I had written in fifth grade that said I wanted to be a lawyer. I don't remember wanting to be that, but um, now reflecting on that, I, I don't think I know or knew any women lawyers or attorneys. Now, thankfully, I am able to support um, a judge who served for 13 years as a public defender, as a um, uh, doing injury um, law cases, you know, has all this experience and she, she does have a strong um, conviction to talking to youth so they can see, um, you know, that she's doing it. But I think it's so very important, especially since uh, women, we represent what 51% of the US population, but less than a third of the seats. So if if that's a thought like, well, I just see all these men, mainly all these white men that are um, in the elected um, positions, is that something really obtainable? Uh, so I think it's so very important. Or will my voice be listened to? I think is it a huge thing of like, if I'm in a room full of men, that's really hard for me to stand up and be like, hey, my opinion is different than yours. And yeah. And I think that's important for women to feel empowered to do because they obviously don't have the same perspectives because they haven't lived the same life as me or been through the same experiences as I have. So I don't know. I think our opinions are hugely valuable, but sometimes they're muffled because there isn't that rep representation. Definitely. And then you see sometimes the old tired um, saying of women are so emotional or too emotional when they do have a difference of opinion. And that reminds me of something Audrey Lord said um, about caring for myself is not self um, indulgence. It is self preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. So I think what you said is exactly right. Um, then it's it's deemed as, oh, she's just emotional. Well, no, actually, I just want to bring this to the table um, because it may make more sense. <laughs> and I think there's a stigma around that of emotions are bad. Like sometimes emotions need to be brought to the table. You need to feel the depth of what I'm feeling in order to understand how others might perceive this situation as well. So like, I, I don't know. I think that that's completely valid. And a lot of people are like, oh, she's just a woman. She's emotional. But like, th that's important too. Like th that should not be disqualified just because they're my personal emotions. I'm sure others are feeling that as well. Definitely. Constituents are human beings, not robots. So, <laughs> And those are some really great points, especially when we see some of the disrespect that women are facing from the local level to the state level to the federal level, we are seeing it, right? So when we talk about representation and being the only one in the room, a concept that we talk about at our office and with a group called Urban Professionals, uh, many of us I'm sure have been in the space where we're the only woman of color or the youngest person in the room or the oldest person in the room or whatever that only kind of identity is, uh, how many of us have been at the end on the attacked end of those things? So anyone kind of want to share any of those experiences as well as, I mean, what we've seen. I think it's it's really sad when you have to see a US representative read someone for calling them the B word or local officials having to argue about their identity. I guess I can jump in here. And first and foremost, it's 
it's very upsetting to be in a space where you're being pointed out because you have a characteristic that is different different than everyone else. And it's good that you're different. It's beautiful you're different, but sometimes people don't perceive it to be that way. Something I've learned while being in my new role is that sometimes whatever they're saying doesn't come out of pure hatred, it's just ignorance. And it's so very offensive, the things that are said, the, the way they say it, it's almost like de we dehumanize each other in that manner. And it's not okay because if I'm in a role where I'm being asked to represent a large population, I think the other person on the ta at the table needs to educate themselves about who they're interacting with, how they need to interact, rather than putting all the burden on us every single time to continue to educate them about why what they said is offensive, how they treated us was wrong, and how they need to treat us. I feel like that responsibility falls on the other person. And I just kind of want to go back to the previous question just a little bit, because I was thinking about why is representation important? So I grew up in Pakistan, and over there, I saw people that were like me, practiced the same religion, had a lot of people to look up to. But when I moved to America, it was it was kind of like, okay, so I don't see a lot of Muslim women of color that are immigrant in these spaces, like political spaces that I want to be in. I see them wanting to do other stuff, such, such as medicine and all of that. But recently, I've seen Ilhan Omar, you know, in politics, someone I look up to, and I'm like, one day I can be like that. One day I can grow up and say, hey, I'm going to represent my views and the views of others who help me be there. She's such an inspiration. And I see other women such as AOC. I see other like, and then going more on the senator level, because I feel like that's something I can achieve as an individual. And because I can't be the president of the United States, but Senate, you know, senator position more achievable. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I know what those women may be going through. And I know they have the experience where they can help me for me to navigate these uncomfortable situations where I may be put down because I'm different. But if they can persevere through it, so can I. I got inspired. Y'all, let's go run for something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Right. So representation, we talked a little bit about representation. We're also talking about the disrespect that representation will garner. So what okay. are you all seeing there and how are you, how do you all combat that? Well, you know, that's how they came up with the angry black woman. Mm. And it is so infuriating because as, as we have discussed, when you share your views and when you let them know that you are not moving just because they have a different view, you become the angry black woman or the angry woman. And, uh, and so that's something, that's one of the reasons why it's so important for DEI programs, so that we can know that diversity, diversity is democracy with teeth. And so we have to actually uh, work at these things. They don't, they are not just gonna fall in our laps. So we just have to stand up for them and be who we are and know that what we have to offer is, is as important as what anybody else might have to offer. Yeah, I really like that um, diversity is democracy with teeth because that then makes me think about um, Wichita and the county of, okay, so our county commissioners, there's one woman out of five. The city council, there's two women out of seven. The 18th Judicial District judges, there's five women out of 28 judges. So is that a reflection of diversity in a true democ democratic process? Right, and parallel that with other facets of diversity, LGBTQ+, persons with disabilities, people of color, those right. numbers get even smaller. Right. right. Very. And, and we you know, this is really an area we need to work on because no matter how much you talk about diversity, if if it's not reflected, then you don't have it. Absolutely. I mean, and I think, right, we've all been in those spaces where folks talk about diversity and inclusion. All the today. time. It's written down, yes. Yes. not reflected. Right. On their wall. <laughs> 
like show me where it is and right and, and we always tell our students too, diversity always exists at some level so you definitely have to define what you mean when you say we want to diversify maybe you lack in some areas but even in a sea full of white folks in a room or an all black room you still have diversity because they're all not going to be the same person right, right but we also have to look at the different facets that make up the term diversity and what we're really trying to do there so for you all what is it that you do to help motivate women to lead run step up okay uh, i'll let i will just say that as a member of um the league of women voters I chair the, I co-chair our DEI. And uh, the first thing you have to do is write up what you see as diversity in general, and then where you want to see it within your own organization. Because people look at you, you know, like they used to say and probably still do, I'd rather see a sermon than to hear one. So it, it really doesn't do a whole lot of good for us to go out and try to encourage people to do something that we are not going to do and that people in our circle are not involved in. So it's a self-examination first. It's okay, you know, as I said earlier, I am not a politician and, that, and I just, that's not my role but I am one to encourage others if I see that spark in you. And so people look at me and the things that I do before they believe me, before they believe that I believe in them, before they believe anything. So uh, I, I would think the first step is to step back and see where you are, make sure you are believable and that what you have been involved in uh, makes people want to at least think about it. I feel like this question is very interesting because I think I'm still in the stage where I'm trying to find my role in the society and how can I help others? But I think an example I can use here is my sorority. When I first came on campus three years ago, almost three years ago, that was like a group of women that kind of embraced me. They're like, hey, you're a freshman. You kind of align with wh what we think, how we practice our religion and let's go hang out. And so, you know, I became part of them and then we became a sorority and it was that experience, what they gave me, they gave me a position of leadership. They told me that, hey, we know it's your first time here, and we'll, we're going to support you. We're going to walk you through the process step by step. We're going to make, we're going to prepare you for something you may not want right now, but maybe in the future. So you may want to be the new Delta Alpha sorority, you know, president. Well, I chose this presidency instead, but that's a whole different story. Um, but I do want to say it started off by them giving me space, them teaching me how I can navigate my way through. And something I noticed, the way they trained me in a sense to be in, in a leadership role, I find myself doing that with some new senators within SGA. I see them coming in passionate, just the same level I had, or sometimes even more. And they wanna learn how I got here, how they can get here. So instead of keeping those secrets to myself, I go out there and I kind of sprinkle it around and I share that with others to let them know that, hey, the journey is difficult. It will not be easy. You have to realize when you're in the room, you may be different, but here's the way you can do it. And you should not stop because others may not deem you fit for it. But instead, your view, as you know, I said previously that, oh, I forgot what I was saying. But <laughs> your view is just as important as theirs. And you have to go through with it. And you have to know that you are just as important as anyone else in the room. You are not more than, and you are not less than advice. That was good advice. Um, yeah, I also think, also think um, looking around if for personally, my experience, if I'm planning something um, event wise, or that has some leadership um, roles, seeing, okay, who isn't at the table, who hasn't been, who do we um, normally 
gravitate to or fill these? And is there potential to? Because I think sometimes myself included, you know, we're, we just get into habits of, okay, I know um, our next event, we've got to do this. Let's go with this person. Um, and oftentimes, um, but being intentional and thinking, okay, who hasn't been at the table when um, there's, there's these capacities that can be filled? Yes, that's important. Yeah, I was going to say on top of that intentionality, again, representation is huge. So like if you can bring others to the table and and make that space, I think that that is super important. But also on top of that, like I think it's important to do it if you want to do it, because I mean, Ridge and I are the first female to get in a very long time that has had the SGA presidency. And like, I think that that's important because people are looking at that and they're saying, freshman women are saying, hey, I could do that too. Like maybe one day that's something me and my best friend could do or whatever. Like, I think that's cool to look at and be like, we're doing something just by being there, you know, and by opening up seats for others to come with us. Awesome. I think also with me, I have had to learn how to utilize my network, right? Like we, I have so many coalition, coalitions I mean, even with the League of Women's Voters, thank y'all so much, y'all. They awarded a few of my interns some scholarships, okay? And both of them were young ladies, okay? So I'm grateful for the opportunities that you have presented to them that I'm able to say, hey, you know, these are these opportunities. And even Danielle and, and Gabriel, um, one of the uh, interns just told me that she ran for, she's like in the government, like she just, I think she said underserved senator. I was like, underserved senator? She's like, yeah, okay. I'm like, okay. So, but like just creating um, spaces and like knowing your network, right? When you, and they come up with opportunities, there is nothing for some of the people in my coalition to throw me an email and say, hey, we have this opportunity, we have this scholarship, we have this. And just being able to spread and, and, and get, you know the ones, and I'm going to be honest, as a mentor, you have those answers. Now, I will specifically give it to them all, but I just know those first two or three, I already know which ones who are going to jump on the opportunity, you know? And, and when, when I know that they um, are going to give their all or when I can sense that there's a specific opportunity for them, I make sure that not only do I follow up with them, I, I asked them straight up, do you need any resources? Do you need a recommendation letter? Like I really try to cultivate and encourage them to grasp all of these opportunities, not just give it to them, but hey, do you need this letter? Do you need this? What do you need in order to, you know, try to grab this opportunity? So the follow-up is important as well, so. Yeah, no, and you hit a good point, Jonathan. coalition building. There are no shortage of folks that will, I see it on social media all the time. No one will support me. Nobody shows up. There's nothing going on. So instead of focusing on that, can you all talk about how your networks have kicked in? Um, what support you've gotten from the community or other women to push things forward? Because many times we focus on what's not happening or how someone didn't show up, but I see coalition building happening all around me. Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> I am a member of many organizations, but the League of Women Voters and Alpha Kappa Alpha, uh, those are two organizations you're going to see everywhere. Everywhere, they will wear you out. You know, if you really, <laughs> you got to, you need to really believe in your heart that this community needs and deserves your attention because through those organizations, you are going to give them the attention you're gonna have. Observer cores, you're going to have. Voter registration uh, departments, you're gonna have. Scholarship builders, you, I mean, all of 15, 20 different organiza organizations within the organizations. And then you are building the, the undergraduates at the same time that you are, are keeping things going in the outer community. So uh, that coalition building is, is just very, very important, but it is also very time consuming. I love it. <laughs> 
Keeps me young. <laughs> so, but yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sure you can go ahead. I'll, <laughs> all right. Well, um, if I recall the question right, it was about the support we received from other women in our community. For me, I think the biggest support I have received on campus, off campus, is from my sorority. And I think it's because they know me so well. They're like, this one, she's a little too passionate. She has a lot of wonderful, maybe sometimes a little too crazy ideas, but you know, she can execute them. And so they were, when I was running for this position, they encouraged me. They supported me on social media. They checked in on me, you know, with me saying, hey, do you need anything? Do you want us to do something extra for you? And I'm like, no, 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 relax. It's okay. I got it. And it was wonderful. And I think the second group of women that really, really helped me be the leader I am today from the beginning till now, my mother and my grandmother, both, both of them strong women. You know, it's so interesting to see how they, whatever they, you know, whatever their capabilities are, they use it to its fullest. And they go out in the community constantly saying, hey, all right, so that person needs our help. Rajab, make sure your you know, calendar is free from this time to this time, and we're going to go help. So they kind of helped me be that leader. And so when I was running for this position, those two were rooting for me since the first time I just told them I want to do this. And they constantly were like, okay, so you need to do this. Did you check in with your friends? Did you use that website called Twitter or something? And it was just so amazing to know that the makeup of who I am came from some of the closest people to me. And it's just beautiful and so fruitful to be around everyone with that same energy, passion, and support. about uh, okay the uh, coalition building is so important and i'm going to be honest i didn't realize how fruitful it is especially in uh, when we had this pandemic i'm just going to be honest it just changed everything for me i'm so used to hitting the ground running being face to face going to schools you know just having these voter registration events i mean i, I go in the office now and i look at my uh because we have a strategy board like it was from like january up until the election I walk in that every time I look, I just laugh. I said, boy, we really thought we had it all planned out, didn't we? <laughs> we thought we, we thought we was, we, man, we had a whole plan. And so for me, it was important to get with other organizations to strategize, especially on this, the technology and how to like come together and, 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 and base build, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we all want the same thing, right? We want to reach people. We want to get people engaged. Well, I mean, the best way to do it is to combine, like you said, Dr. Cranford, like, right, to, we understand that even in all the chaos, the thing is to still get everyone together and unite and get things done, right? right. So for me, the coalitions have been the best, I mean, I have some groups, I just, as soon as I hit that list, list meet, I get happy because it's just, the energy is just so great. And it's, and we get a lot of things done, right? Like to me, um, that's the most important thing, right? Because we can talk and we can talk, but I like for things to get done. Like I'm still excited over what happened this weekend, right? The parade, the caravan. I was just yeah. like, it was, it was such great energy. I enjoyed that so much. And that again is coalition building, right? Yeah. And that's, and, and we got so much done. So I'm just, I'm proud. I'm so happy all the coalitions I'm with. They rock. So that's all I got to say. <laughs> and this is definitely a good segue into our last 10 minutes. Let's talk tangibles, right? Everybody's always talking about it, but not a lot of folks are about the work. So how do you, how do you be about it? How do you move from talking about it to be about it? So what are things that folks can get engaged with? How can they step up? What work needs to be done? Nikayla, I saw you unmuted. You gotta be in these streets. <laughs> in these streets. <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally. Um, it here and but I really 
had a profound um, experience when I was working in Fargo, a predominantly new American community, and the um, public health department there had put on healthy cooking classes. And that was my role coming in to improve access. So very relatable here, especially in 67214. Um, but, you know, throughout that time, I ended up getting 50 participants through the through the class and they you know were like how did you do that how did you well I went door to door and talked to people to see what would work for them and it was a, a simple matter of they had it at 3 p.m and they were all at work you know so I think it's 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 things like that um getting involved and seeing all these opportunities of events um you know being had and how some folks may not have the time to reach out, unfortunately. So it's a matter of you reaching um, to them and saying, okay, I see this event. Do they need extra hands, um, you know, with voter registration? Like there's an event um, next Saturday that we would like to have voter registration. So I might be reaching out to Ruth the Powers after this, you know? So it's just um, making those connections, I feel, and, and really um, uh, hitting the pavement. And of course, social media is so important during this COVID situation, as they say, yeah. Coronas is on us. And it, so, it, yeah, it changes so, things a bit, a bit. You could leave a flyer. Yes, yes. And we, we have to have a, a strong and vibrant um, website and, and the members need to be on uh, wh whichever uh, media you like to use, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or whatever it is, we, we, we just need to collectively and individually stay busy. And uh, with this being our hundredth year, I put in that plug again, uh, before Corona hit, we were on a roll too. I mean, you know, we, we started in it, uh, in August of, of, well, we started before 2019 because 2019 is when the league in Wichita, we are the first league of women voters in the United States, Wichita, Kansas. And so we celebrated that in conjunction with celebrating the national things and, and the 19th amendment. So we, we kicked off with, with a very diverse banquet at Wichita State. And, then, and we had something, two or three things on the calendar for every year. We, we were in the River Festival Parade. We had 35, 40 women marching in 2019. And we were going to bookend it. We're going to do it again in 2020. So I'm just saying, just, just keep whatever it is that you are doing in the forefront. Try to get the news media out. Uh, just do everything you can, whatever you're working on. Make sure that it is advertised and your members are busy. Yes, good point. Yeah, canvassing has changed a little bit. So you can pick up the phone, you can do send some texts out, you know, look right. to see what women candidates there are and tap into that. Yeah, in student government, the, you know, I feel like the combination of saying what you're gonna do and then doing it goes hand in hand. So for those students who might be watching, if you wanna join student government, please do so. Our work starts off by talking about the issue as to what are, what are the issues students are facing during this time. And as you have these conversation, us as the leadership, myself and Mackenzie Haas, and then we have Speaker of the Senate, Olivia Babin, we will get you connected to those people who directly hold jurisdiction over a certain area of issue that you might be facing or a student might be facing. So I know a lot of people who apply to Senate positions, they feel like that that may be just it. You are here and then you're given the work. No, in our student government, we have to come up with the work and then we have to go towards solving it. And so, yes, majority of the time we do hear in the general population that people say they're gonna do it, but they don't end up doing it. With student government, you say you're gonna do it and then you have those conversations and then something gets done. And so I would encourage anyone and everyone who's watching to be part of the student government, no matter who you are, come here, join us, we're gonna help you. And quite frankly, I believe this session, we've been doing quite a bit and we've been engaged through our social media as everyone was saying here, engage each other in voting, make sure that you're 
doing your part because I know a lot of students may not feel like they may have your vote, but that's, that's necessary. We have to go out and represent our voice because our vote is our right and we need to practice those rights at the end of the day. And I know student government will be doing a lot more pushing regarding that. And so I feel like I went on a tangent there, but the points got across. <laughs> And I think to engage in information as well. I mean, like to push out information about how to vote and how to register and all of these other things is super important, but also to listen. And, and I think like Rija said, like get involved students if you're watching, be involved in SGA or, or a different, you know, uh, form of involvement on campus. But at the same time, even if you're not involved, please just tweet us or, you know, reach out, tell us what your, your the issues you're facing because we can't do anything about it if we don't know about it. And so that's a huge thing too, is like we are listening and we're trying to to engage with, with the student body, but there has to be some, some feedback there too. And Root the Power is actively recruiting right now. So, um, I will be on the Friends University campus this Friday and next Friday, but we'll probably have something up on our page, but we are actually recruiting college students as well. That's something that has changed. We usually uh, have a predominant like uh, high school age, but I feel like um, we needed to concentrate more on an 18 and up level as far as uh, actual young people that could actually vote, right? Um, not that we're not gonna do high school age, we're just going to do it in a different dynamic. We're going to cultivate um, a culture of young people so that when they get to that college age, they'll be ready, right? They'll be ready to, to do the things that we're talking about now. But as far as um, recruitment, if y'all know anybody, just putting that plug in, um, <laughs> let them know we are, we are recruiting, and it's a paid internship, okay? so. Keyword paid. All right. That's all I got to say. <laughs> well, you're not going to get paid in the league, but we are always in recruitment mode from 16 to 116, men included. And uh, we have something for you to do. So please go to our website and uh, just join up and work with us because we, we're going to make it happen. Um, well, we've come to our time. I want to thank each and every one of you. I've personally had the opportunity to work alongside you all, and I see that you all are powerhouses and game changers. And I think one of the most important things that each and every one of you do is invite folks to the table, regardless of background. And my hope is that folks watching this see that as a takeaway, that many of us cross over in the work that we do from coalition building. But most importantly, whether we know you or not, we're going to ask you to serve. And that's really where it starts is asking someone to step up and serve and giving them the information they need to be successful when they get in that space. So I want to thank you all. I also want to do a quick thank you to Quang, the only gentleman that is actually on here that you all can't see, who has been, he's our tech person, dropped a number of comments. Um, we do have a survey. So I ask that if you see that survey in the comments, and I'm sure he'll drop it again, for you to take the survey, let us know how you felt about the panel, and let us know about some upcoming programs you would like for us to put out. We're doing a number of Zoom programs just like this one this year. Like you all have shared, we had a whole plan for the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Programming, and we didn't have to switch that plan up. And so <laughs> you'll see a lot of us on the book, and you'll also be able to see us on YouTube. So please follow us on our WSU diversity page. This will be living on that page as well, and it will have captioning. We want to ensure that things are accessible. I do apologize that currently we don't have captioning, but you will be able to watch this on playback on our YouTube page. So thank you all again. Continue to celebrate Women's Equality Day. We're certainly not there yet. Um, there's still voter suppression happening across this country, and there's ways that we can combat that as well. So get engaged, register to vote, check your registration to ensure that you can vote, all that great information, get the facts, know your polling location, and make sure that you continue to tune in to the upcoming programs and events that the Office of Diversity and Inclusion will be pushing out and get to know these women because they have a lot of work to get you into. Thank you all. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.